Hi, I'm Julie Harper from Birmingham, Alabama. I love to treat acne, and so next we're going to talk about some more challenging acne cases that I'm pretty sure all of us encounter probably on a pretty regular basis. So we'll just jump right in. So case number one, this is a 23-year-old female. She is five months pregnant. She's had acne for years, but her acne unfortunately has worsened during pregnancy. That doesn't always happen. A lot of times acne actually gets better during pregnancy, but hers has worsened. She also plans to nurse once the baby is born and would really like to nurse for six months. So we need to keep that in mind as well. She has no known drug allergies. So what do we do? And I think I put this in here just to remind us that we don't have to do nothing. And somebody who is pregnant, we do have things that our pregnant patients can benefit from and that we can use safely. There are more than the ones I've listed here, but I think these are a pretty good starting point. So three for three, so three options three trimesters, and it's not that one's for the first trimester and one's for third. You could use these at any point during the pregnancy. So the three topicals are the ABCs, azelaic acid, benzoyl peroxide, and clindamycin. So benzoyl peroxide, some people uh, are concerned because it by itself in the past has been rated as a pregnancy category C, but we really know that it is metabolized and broken down into benzoic acid in the skin, and it is perfectly safe to use during pregnancy. You could also use topical clindamycin. And by the way, if you're gonna do that, probably use benzoyl peroxide with it so that we're not selecting for resistance. The three oral antibiotics that you can use are ACE, A-C-E, that is amoxicillin, cephalexin, and erythromycin. Now there's one, the erythromycin estolate that we're supposed to stay away from, but you certainly can use these if you need them. Um, tetracyclines during pregnancy, I think all of us know this is something that we really want to avoid. They are absolutely contraindicated after the 15th week of pregnancy. Don't use them, that's in all caps with an exclamation point. But it might be interesting to you to know that there's been no increased risk of congenital malformations that have occurred with inadvertent first trimester use. And that has been reported. So, you know, so, so often we think somebody's going to try to get pregnant in six months, I better stop the tetracycline. Um, again, we're not going to do it on purpose, but if somebody does come up pregnant in that first trimester, it's really going to be more second trimester where we would have a problem. You just stop the medication and move forward, and that shouldn't be something you have to worry about if it was very early exposure. Also, no increased incidence in 274 women with tetracycline exposure in the first trimester. That's a second publication there, and you can see the two references. Um, spironolactone is one we think about a little bit too, and we're not intentionally going to have anybody on that who is pregnant. That risk is a hypothetical risk that if a woman gets pregnant and she's having a male baby and she's on this systemic anti-androgen, that it could affect the development of the male fetus. This would also be late in the first trimester. And as far as I know, this has still not ever been reported. It's really a hypothetical risk. What about severe acne? We certainly don't want to just leave that untreated. For the most severe acne, you could use something like systemic prednisone. Certainly if somebody had acne fulminan, you could use systemic uh, prednisone. Ideally, we're going to want to use this at lower doses, doses, doses less than 20 milligrams a day during pregnancy. And it says no more than one month and preferably during the third trimester. Um, I think I would work just very closely with the um, obstetrician if we needed prednisone and something like acne fulminan to get outside of those parameters. But in general, that's something that we can use. We do know that human studies have showed an increased risk of oral cleft and a slight increase in miscarriage rates and preterm births and uh, babies that were exposed in utero to systemic prednisone. And just real quick, treating in the nursing mother, um, spironolactone is deemed compatible with lactation by both the American Academy of Pediatrics and the World Health, Health Organization. And that's because spironolactone's metabolite, canrenone, gets into the breast milk at a very, very low percentage of the active. We do want to remember that this drug can cause diuresis, probably not terribly likely at the dosage, dosages that we're using for acne. So 50 milligrams, 100 milligrams a day, but still a potential risk there. I think this is tremendously helpful. If you're not familiar with this, this is LactMed at the NIH, and you can really just put in LactMed and Google that and you will come up with this. And when you do, you can look for certain drugs and it will tell you what we know about them in uh, lactation. For example, here's amoxicillin. So we could read about this 
Uh, limited inflammation indicates that amoxicillin produces low levels in milk that are not expected to cause adverse effects in breastfed infants. We could also look here at prednisone. The amounts of prednisone in breast milk are very low. No adverse effects have been reported in breastfed infants. So I'm not going to read all of this to you. I just think it's a, a really helpful resource, and I want you to be aware of it. Okay, number two, a 17-year-old female, Fitzpatrick skin type 5, moderate to severe acne with acne-induced macular hyperpigmentation. So, of course, what I'm getting at here is hyperpigmentation is a really big deal for people, and oftentimes in our skin of color population, it's at least as big a deal of the acne, if not more so. We also know it's going to respond more slowly to treatment, so we have to be really aware of that. It's common. Hyperpigmentation occurs in 45 to 87 percent of those people who are Fitzpatrick skin type 4 through 6. Most of the time in acne-induced macular hyperpigmentation, and I am saying that instead of PIH on purpose, uh, because it's not really after inflammation. Inflammation is still going on, so we're trying to get this name to change but it's too long, to acne-induced macular hyperpigmentation. Uh, but most of it's epidermal, which makes it maybe a little bit more treatable less frequently. It can be that deeper blue-gray dermal pigment, but it is long-lasting. In one report I saw, more than 50% of the people reported that the hyperpigmentation had been present for more than a year. And there were plenty of people who said way longer than that. This, of course, has a negative impact on quality of life. And so it's important that we treat it. And the question always is, well, do I treat it first? Do I treat the acne first? And I think the consensus right now is that we treat both. You do have to get the acne under control, particularly the inflammatory part of the disease. So we can treat acne by using anti-inflammatories and by using products like retinoids that are also helping to increase cell turnover. Both of those things likely are going to help pigment as well. We also don't want to make the problem worse. So you're going to choose products that are well tolerated that won't worsen hyperpigmentation. Recommend daily sun protection. Two of my favorites to use would be azelaic acid and retinoids because they're doing double duty. They're helping with acne, but also with hyperpigmentation. Superficial chemical peels can also be very beneficial and they help both the acne and the hyperpigmentation. And then lastly, hydroquinone. Uh, but you have to be careful with this one. You know, people are going to need to spot treat on the dark areas. You can get over lightening or you could get kind of a halo effect around the dark areas. Uh, and I think most people would agree that when you're using hydro hydroquinone, it probably does better uh, when it's in one of those uh, products where it's mixed with, for example, a steroid uh, or another product that's mixed with it also does well with retinoids. Case number three, 15 year old male with severe nodular acne on the trunk and face. He has had acne for three years, but it's gradually worsened. He denies fever or arthritis and otherwise he feels okay. He has a family history of scarring. He's concerned about scarring and he avoids eye contact during the initial visit. So what I'm trying to get across here is this is kind of a 911. This is somebody who is really looking depressed about this. They um, have a family history of scarring. This is this is bad acne. It's not just on the face, it's on the trunk. It's, it's been there for three years. We know the longer acne goes without being successfully treated, the higher risk of scarring. And of course, I'm asking about fever and arthritis because I want to know if there's any indication of acne fulminan because we really want to stay away from that. If we're not already there, we want to stay away from that. So of course, I think we're going to put this person on isotretinoin. So who is at risk for isotretinoin-induced acne fulminan? Who is that? It's adolescent males, almost always guys, between the ages of 13 and 22, most commonly in Caucasians. They almost always have a prior history of acne with a mean duration of two years of acne, and it's almost always truncal. Now, there is something out there called rosacea fulminan, which is not this at all. So that would be women usually women who are a little bit older, maybe around the time of pregnancy, and they haven't had a lot of rosacea beforehand, and then they just explode with it, but they never have systemic symptoms. Sometimes people do with acne fulminan, more often they don't. So let's say we're going to start this person. They don't have acne fulminan yet, but we're going to start them on isotretinoin. What are we, what are we going to do to prevent it? Because this is somebody that we're a little bit concerned about that. With. So we're going to start at lower doses than normal. I would normally start at 0.5 mix per kg per day. Oftentimes I'm starting at like 30 milligrams a day. I might start at 10 milligrams a day. So pulling that dose back, 
or 20 milligrams a day, just pulling it back a little bit. You can start prednisone at the same time. And I usually go ahead and do one mg per kg per day, at least, you know, for the first week or so. You could do this probably just for the first two to four weeks and then taper because we're not treating acne fulminan yet. We're trying to avoid it. But if the acne worsens at any time point, we're going to stop isotretinoin for a few weeks, restart it at a lower dose, and continue to overlap with prednisone. Also consider using high potency topical steroids one to two times a day if there is an area already that has any signs of like granulation or being oozy or anything like that. So don't forget the topicals there too. This is what we're trying to avoid. So let's imagine that this person calls in, we didn't start prednisone, we just started isotretinoin maybe at our typical 0.5 mix per kg per day, and then they come in and they're worse and they're oozy and they're draining. So this now is isotretinoin induced acne fulminan. Um, we see these large cyst and um, erosions down on the neck here. So now, now what do we do? So what if acne fulminan is induced by isotretinoin? Stop the isotretinoin. Begin, don't ever drive that dose up higher. It's tempting uh, if you're not real familiar with this, don't ever drive the dose higher, pull it off. Stop isotretinoin, begin prednisone one mg per kg per day for four weeks. Consider high dose topical steroids again on those eroded, oozy places. If the inflammation is better at week four, then you can restart the isotretinoin, but do it at a lower dose while you continue the prednisone and then gradually taper off that prednisone while slowly increasing the isotretinoin dose. But again, never drive the dose up. So acne fulminan, we can have acne fulminan with or without isotretinoin and you can have it with or without symptoms. And that's what we're looking at here. I don't know that I've ever seen acne fulminan without isotretinoin, I'll be honest. And I've seen a lot of acne. I have certainly seen it induced by isotretinoin and that is the most common type. That's the one listed here at the bottom. So it's drug induced, but does not have those systemic symptoms. If you had acne fulminant with systemic symptoms, things like bone pain, fever, then you need to do um, a lab evaluation. You need to be checking for anemia. You need to do a CBC and then also look at markers of inflammation like an ESR or a C-reactive protein. If they have uh, symptoms of bone pain, do an x-ray of the involved areas looking for osteolytic lesions. And those are certainly really tough cases. Okay, case number four, this is a 15-year-old boy. He has moderate to severe acne, several nodules, okay? Um, so pretty severe. This is a case I'm dealing with right now, by the way. He's been minimally responsive to seracycline and the adapalene benzoyl peroxide fixed dose combination and clascoterone. So I've had him on all of that. And we've done it for a while. I really probably would have liked to have gotten to isotretinoin a little sooner. I also gave his older brother isotretinoin at one point. His mom had acne. They're also personal friends of ours, of course, but he's short and he's really, really worried about being short. His parents are worried about it. They've, they're, they're concerned. So what the heck do we do? Okay. Because we do know out there, it has been reported. It's, it's, it's true that this drug can cause premature closure of the epiphyses, but how do we handle that? Well, I can tell you in this case, I told them that information and they decided to wait for a long time. They did finally, right now we're on isotretinoin. And by the way, I just had to add prednisone to him because his acne is just that bad that uh, I think he could try to go down that acne fulminan road. So, but he's done all those treatments. He's now on isotretinoin, but how do you counsel about this? So I would first of all say, yes, premature epiphyseal cl plate closure does happen. But it's really been reported maybe a time or two in people who are on normal doses for acne. Can we say that that is a cause and effect relationship? Absolutely not. We cannot. But most of the reports in the literature are in children who've been given this drug for many years at a very high daily dose. Look at the list here. So a 10 and a half year old boy with epidermolytic hyperkeratosis after four and a half years of isotretinoin at about 3.5 mg per kg per day. And I won't read all of this to you, but that's where we would think that we would see this, not in people in general who are on routine doses. But I think we educate our patients, we let them make the decision and some of them probably will wait. Do we have much data 
looking at courses of isotretinoin, the kind that we use for acne, and we do have a little bit. So this was a study, it's kind of old now. It was published in 2004. There were 217 pa patients between the ages of 12 and 17 enrolled in 19 different centers. Uh, most of the patients completed 20 weeks. Most of them um, made it all the way to that point. 181 patients in the end were included in the per protocol analysis. So the amount they were given, it was a BID dosing for a mean of about 133 days, and they were given one mig per kg per day. They did have bone mineral densities checked at the lumbar spine and hip using the DEXA instruments. And then they also had a single lateral radiograph of the cervical spine, just looking for any dish findings or anything like that. Those are other bony changes that you could see with isotretinoin. But what they found was that the bone min mineral density of the lumbar spine actually increased from baseline to the end of study. Sometimes retinoids can be associated with osteoporosis, and that certainly wasn't seen here. The bone mineral density of the hip decreased slightly. Uh, bone mineral density at Ward's triangle decreased from baseline to the end of the study, but that's an area that's imprecise and we're not supposed to base any, any conclusions on that. Hyperostosis and other sclerotic change in the cervical spine were uniform, uniformly absent at both baseline and, and the final visit. So when you look at this, at least we did not see any significant bony changes in people treated for that length of time at one mg per kg per day who were in the, the adolescent age group. Okay, case number five. This is a 26-year-old female. She has had minimal acne in her adolescent years. Acne started a few months after implantation of a hormonal IUD, so that would be with levonorgestrel. She does not want to remove the IUD, but she does not want to have acne. And so now what do we do? And I know this is something that we all see. A recent uh, study was just published that, that shows, yes, in fact, there is an increased rate of acne in people who have hormonal IUDs versus those who have non-hormonal IUDs. And we're not surprised because the progestin levonorgestrel by itself, you know, if it's in a birth control pill with estrogen, that estrogen is going to kick in and it's going to be a net overall anti-androgen effect. But progestins by themselves can be pro-androgenic. They can act like androgens. And so that's more than likely what we're, we're dealing with here. But I would then treat with an anti-androgen like oral spironolactone or, or topical clascoterone for spironolactone. I still like dosages of 25 to I'll say 100 milligrams. I very seldom go above that. You do have to be aware of side effects. And I put a little extra part in here. You know, the number one, the most common side effect with spironolactone is menstrual irregularities, but probably not in somebody who has an IUD. So this gives us an opportunity to push that dose a little more, get up to that 100 milligrams, maybe higher if you're comfortable with that, because the number one complaint this person just should not have. Um, we can also see breast tenderness and swelling, fatigue and headaches. Now, a couple things we've learned about this over the last few years, there is no need to check potassium in healthy women between the ages of 18 and 45. There's no evidence of an increased risk of breast cancer in women with exposure to spironolactone. It may be slow, it might take three months to kick in, so be patient, maybe co-prescribe some other things as you start with it. And then set the expectation. This is likely going to be long-term treatment. You can use this in combination with all kinds of things. Topical retinoids probably should be the case most of the time, but you could use topical benzoyl peroxide. You could use oral antibiotics. You could even use isotretinoin and overlap that. And lastly, you could do clascoterone now. So we have a topical antiandrogen. So this competitively binds the androgen receptor and all of its effects stays in the skin. It's quickly metabolized to an inactive form. All of the effect is in the skin. And so this will work not just in our female patients, but remember all acne is hormonal, even acne in a 12 year old guy. So this can be used in men and women, but it should be used BID. So that's a run through some challenging cases. I hope you learned something through some of those. If you have ideas that you'd like to hear about for more challenging cases, cases I would love for you to let me know. Thanks for your attention.